to the next important discussion is mooring systems. Now, mooring systems uh, take up uh, more than say 50 percent of the cost of your platforms, especially the, if it is a floating platform. Now, for fixed type, of course, you do not say jackets. Of course, they do not require moorings. So, because these are piled to your seabed. So, of course, obviously, moorings, there is no question of having moorings, but moorings you will find they are essential uh, part of the floating platforms. Now, floating platform design uh, is centered around type of moorings. So, as much as say 60 to 70 percent of the platform cost is taken up by the moorings and not only the, uh, that one, the other part that you as a designer you have to think about is the weight, weight and space requirements. Weight and space allocation for mooring lines. The example I am giving you say a semi submersible, semi submersible in deep water. So, so all these platforms that is the floating platforms are essentially for deep water. Deep water of course, then the length of the line will be quite large. So, semi submersible example you have say 8, 8 kilometer long chain cables, chain mooring lines. <coughs> now, the problem is uh, the first thing is this will have lot of weights, a few thousand tons of weight will go. So, that means you have to have sufficient buoyancy in the columns to support this weight from the naval architectural point of view. The other point is where you are going to store the huge, this huge amount of chain cable. So, obviously, most of these cables are stored in the columns itself and that will increase the column diameter and the length of the column also. So, with this the uh, number of engineers they have thought about how to reduce the size of the cables etcetera. And uh, the problem of this uh, mooring lines is the basic design is centered around. So, design of moorings. So, moorings are essentially designed to, to reduce vessel motions. There is a primary task of your any mooring lines. Now, here normally uh, what is done? Uh, the moorings uh, which are uh, done by means of chains, mooring chains, they are assisted by thrusters. In offshore platforms, if you come across, you will find they are thrusters at the bow and stern. So, thruster support to mooring lines are also given. Thrusters together plus your moorings. So, these are normally given in platforms. So, the total system these thrusters plus mooring is called a DP system that is directional positioning system. Now, the whole thing is actually controlled from the bridge by means of control. So, this is called a essentially a feedback control. Now, feedback control I think is, uh, I do not know whether you have studied this in electrical engineering. So, this is actually the job of the <coughs> electronics or electrical engineer. So, that means the motions of the ship they are given to this controller and automatically it excites 
your DP system that is your thruster system. Now the moorings are also connected to the winches, so those are called mooring. So these are some of the items that you come across in a ship or a platform mooring systems. So mooring system components you will have say mooring systems if you think about the total system as such mooring systems the essential components first you have mooring chains or sometimes this is called a chain cable. Number two is you have windlass where you wind this chain on the deck. A windlass actually keeps on winding this chain cable and lifts what is called anchors. Anchors are the objects which are connected to your chain cable at one end and it digs the seabed, it cramps your seabed. So those are called anchors. And there are a number of types of anchors, say whether you have a bow anchor or a say uh, this thing what is called heavy mass, the displacement type of anchor, there are now large number of categories of anchors according to the ships or the vessels uh, they, uh, they are connected with. So mooring chains, windlass anchors, next you have mooring winches. So these are some of the equipment equipments for a ships or for a platforms mooring systems. Okay. Now all this in detail actually I um, will not be able to discuss in this uh, class, this proper class will be your ship design. Now you will find this in you read this book ship design in ship design by Taggart describes all these systems. Now so far so good, so good. Now how do you design the, all these items? Say mooring chain, mooring chain first of all you have to design say the first one length of chain cable. So I will just work out a problem where you can find out this length of chain. The other thing that you, you have to design is size that is the diameter of the chain cable. Now how are you going to design this? So this size of chain, the basic design for any chain cable or the number 2 is called the anchor, anchor size or anchor mass. So these are designed based on the holding power, holding power of the anchor. You have to calculate this holding power of the anchor. So this is given by formulas which are given in your Lloyd's register or if you turn the pages of LRS or ADS, you will find the formulas for calculating the holding power of the anchor. The holding power of the anchor if you want to calculate, then you have to calculate what are the loads which are coming onto the ship. So what type of loads that are coming to the ship, so you will find basically you will find drift forces. I do not know whether you have been taught how to calculate drift forces which are coming onto the ship. Then you have what are the other forces? One is uh, drift and the other you will find is forces from current. So the calculation actually is not that easy. Current then you have wind. So all these forces are coming onto the ship, this is the environmental forces which are causing tension in the chain cable and ultimately your force is going to the anchor. 
So, you have to be very specific of the calculation of these what is, what is called the environmental forces on ships. Now, this actually I think you, you are taught in your that sea motions or sea keeping class, environmental forces. So, you have to calculate these forces, unless you calculate these forces, you cannot find out the holding power of the anchor. So, this is the first job. Now, if you turn the pages of Lloyd's register or ABS, you will find. So, they give you a formula for calculating the holding power of the anchor and with that you end up with a certain number which is called a equipment number. equipment number. So, this you have to calculate by looking into the pages of Lloyd's and after you have calculated the equipment the other is the automatically you will get the chain cable size. So, if from this you can calculate size of chain cable, size of chain cable then you can calculate the mass of the anchor. So, all these things will come automatically. Now, these anchors and chain cables, they are not manufactured in the shipyard. So, there are specialized companies or firms which companies or firms which specialize in manufacturing what is called deck machinery. So, these are actually bought out items, these are all bought out items by the shipyard itself. Now, as naval architects, you have to give the required size of this uh, say deck machinery size. Now, normally if you order a windlass or say mooring winch, so these are given by the if you want to order this, so these are based on the requisite torque you have to find out how much torque your mooring winch will give or your windlass, windlass will give the, with, uh, along with the size of the chain cable. Hmm. So, those the, that is the um, job of the naval architect, he is, gives quotation and, and requisitions all this from the deck machinery equipment supplier. So, you will get in standard sizes you will not, these are not tailor made items. So, these have to be ordered quite in advance. So, the, if you go to the ship's design office, so you have to order, after you order the main engine, you calculate your resistance and powering, from that you order the main engine. So, this is your next job is to order the um, deck machinery items, the mooring items. And prior to that, you should have ordered steel that is your plates and sections, otherwise your hull shop will go without order that is will be laid off. So, this normally the naval architect's job uh, starts from that. So, this is one of the job that you are going to do, but how to proceed I am telling you is you first you calculate the all the forces that are coming to your ship that is your drift forces, current, wind etcetera, drift and also your waves there is the horizontal forces which are coming and with that you calculate the holding power of the anchor from this you revert to your equipment numeral that is it is to be found in Lloyd's or ABS and from this you calculate all these sizes. Okay. So, after that this is how you proceed. Now, in case of offshore if you go say offshore actually the offshore mechanics is much more uh, difficult if you want to, as far as the calculation of these environmental forces are come and there are elaborate computer programs which calculate the mooring uh, machinery or the mooring systems. So, moorings are actually done by dedicated computer programs.
So, this actually I am not going to detail those of you in our actually in our department we have a program which is called Orca Flex. So, we will try to have some exposure to this uh, last process then. So, this is a dedicated mooring line calculation for ships moorings. So, nowadays you have software which are specific to your ships requirement like you have uh, for ship motions for motion calculations you have a software which is called C load. So, this is actually a motion calculation software. So, these are normally done by your they are done by specialized firms which uh, they are engineers we are dealing with all these softwares. Anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, this uh, normally if you have experience in all these softwares you can nowadays your design office will use all these softwares. Now, what I want to tell you is this, this uh, uh, manufacturing deck machinery. So, they will have all this soft, uh, they will uh, give your indent for all these machinery. Now, moorings are actually based on the static design. So, mooring system design is not that simple. There are three design stages. First, in marine we have the static design that is you calculated the forces and moments which are coming from the simple uh, uh, static analysis. Now, after that you have something in between a static design and a dynamic design which is called a quasi or a semi static design. This is called a quasi static design. And the last one is called a complete dynamic design. So, you can see if you actually go into the calculations of your moving lines, you have to do these three types of analysis. Now, how this is done I think uh, in subsequent class I will just give you an inkling the about the formula. The you know, quasi static and the dynamic is based on whatever in your vibration class that is you are doing that is you have to formulate your equation of motion like this m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x that is equals to your external force which is again dependent on time. So, this is your basic dynamic equation static design is you are I will just work out a problem on static design. Now, here the before we go into this complicated thing you should have some idea of I will give you the various um, moorings which are done in the offshore. In the offshore if you go there are large number of uh, uh, platforms which catered with easier called mooring boyers. Now, boyers you will find they are uh, similar to your platforms, but uh, smaller in size. Now, there are large number of mooring boyers actually you will find in offshore. So, offshore is actually centered around platforms offshore is centered around design of this the platforms. If you go into this uh, offshore business, then you have mooring boyers. Now, what else you, you are going to have? Platforms, moving bars connected by deep sea piping. Here, are three major. items of offshore industry. Offshore industry is basically centered around design of platforms, boyers and underwater piping. This is the offshore scenario. Now, platforms I have just um, uh, uh, talked about the different types of platforms. 
now coming to this mooring buoys and deep sea piping actually after I finish buoys I will come to piping. Now piping design is uh, very complicated, first thing you have to design the structural arrangement then there is flow and all these things are there. So this is the specialized job of a the piping engineer. See most of your uh, shipyards, if you go to your uh, shipyard then you will come across this person, a piping engineer. So he is a specialized person who is dealing with all the piping and nowadays also you have software support. Software is there for your piping design. So this uh, is this is a complete uh, another branch of study, but uh, it is well developed and it is a specialized job. Now coming to this mooring uh, uh, thing, now the basic systems that you have to design the mooring systems. Mooring systems you will find there are in offshore there are two large categories or distinct categories. You will find one is called a spread mooring system. This is called a spread. Now this is similar to your ship, ship mooring systems or spread mooring. The other find, other one is called turret mooring. Yeah, these are two broad categories. Uh, turret actually you will find that uh, there are, I will we'll come across a number of diagrams you will find that the ship actually revolves about this turret. Turret is a structure that is which is housed just below your derrick in a moon pool and the ship actually rotates about this turret or uh, sometimes this is called weather vaning. It weather vanes about a turret. So, um, offshore you want to design your platform or a FPSO, you first decide what type of moorings you are going to give to the uh, platform. Now remember moorings I constitute about 60 to 75, 70 percent cost. Now spread, now the problem that is coming up with this mooring systems, I told you an example that I have given you that a semi submersible may have as much as 8 kilometers of mooring chains. So here is an example of a spread mooring system. If you look from the top, you can have, so normally this is an FPSO or a chip. Now at the front you have number of mooring chains which are connected by wires uh, or chains and here at the stern of the ship also you will come across these three types of, you now these are anchors. So this is your FPSO, oh. FPSO stands for floating production and storage and offloading. So right, so this is an example of uh, what is called a spread mooring system. So that means your mooring wires are just spread around the ship. Now in turret mooring actually you will find that instead of the mooring chains that is you are coming from the bow and stern, you have a specific location at the ship. Now you can house the turret, turret are normally housed either at the forward end of the ship or at the midship region. In some turrets, uh, uh, turret mooring I will just, uh, next class I will give, uh, show you some pictures of turret mooring. So you can house the turret outside the just uh, away from the stem of the ship or bow of the ship. So that is that will be called an external turret or you can house the turret inside the ship. So there are two types of turrets you will come across. Turret is this is called internal turret. So 
So, internal turret position inside hull. inside the hull of ship. The internal turret actually is more preferable because you can have ready access to the turret from the ship. Now, if you are unable to do this internal turret, then you go for an external turret. Now, the, you can see that the turret is a source of fire, that means it is a fuel source, is not it? It is a fuel source because the associated piping that is coming from the well head through your conductor pipe or marine riser, they are finally going, coming to the manifold in the turret. So, that means it is a fuel source and turret, the one thing I forgot that when you are designing the spaces, you can write down that spaces that is space protection when you are doing this firewall, barrier wall, blast wall in closed spaces, you do proper venting of the spaces. Proper venting, what is venting? That is have suitable ventilation arrangement inside the spaces. Otherwise, there will be collection of uh, there is combustible gases combustible gases should not accumulate in a closed space for a certain period of time because um, in normally in platforms you will find they flare the excess gas. So, there will be a lot of heat is generated and these entrapped gases will ignite. So, they will cause a blast. So, that means whenever you have enclosed spaces, ventilation is a very important parameter for the space. So, that is why in ships you will find normally the naval architect, these are the three most important systems that a naval architect should know. One is the, I talked about is the mooring system, other is called a havoc system, heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Mooring system, the havoc systems, the other is the piping system, the three systems which are very, very important if you want to do a good GA drawing. Hmm. GA drawing. So, this is similar to your both offshore platforms actually the problems in your GA definition is much more because if you have, you have limited area, you have to segregate all the spaces, protect the spaces, have access. The other thing is that um, the space allocation and the other is the vent venting of the spaces. So, three systems the naval architect should be very well off actually. Anyway, I will try to give you some idea of all this in all these in this offshore class, but um, let us come to the we are now we, we have gone into the mooring systems. Uh, moorings are also important because you have to control motions. Now, if you are unable to control <coughs> motions, then the platform has to be shut down. Motions, motion restriction I told you, it is very, very important in case of platform design. Ships are uh, to some extent uh, it is affected by motions because they will cause discomfort to the crew, is not it? Crew discomfort will be high in case of very large heave re, uh, pitch and roll motions. But in case of platforms, motions are still more important because the platforms will suffer what is called a weather downtime. weather downtime, that means the platform is out of service, excess motions, excess motions leading to risk of life and risk of riser failure. That is your marine riser, if you have excess motions, that means it is going to break or it is going to snap, mooring line snap. So, we have to shut down all these uh, yeah, because the simple reason is that your platforms are doing your drilling operation or producing the oil from a specific location in the seabed. Now, you, if you have a hurricane or a cyclone coming, you immediately you cannot run away from that or if you have a 
particular unfavorable C state. So, the C states I have told you, the unfavorable C states you have to shut down the platform. It, you may not run the risk of losing the platform as such, but immediately you have to shut down operations. So, that is called a weather downtime. So, motion restrictions you have to do very rigorously by with the help of efficient mooring systems. So, which mooring systems you are going to design? So, mooring analysis is very critical in your offshore engineering study. So, I told you that uh, um, the, uh, the three types that is your quasi static, static, quasi static and dynamic. Anyway, so, I will start this static analysis, but before I go on to this, the spread mooring system and just told about the turret mooring system. Now, this is an example of a uh, spread mooring system. Now, turret if you have a, a, a the, that means you have a moon pool sort of thing out here. Say this is a forward turret and your ship actually revolves around a disc which is secured uh, at on the keel of the ship or the base of the ship and the ship actually revolves about this about a disc and these are your mooring lines, they are connected by anchors. So, this is called a turret. So, this is an FPSO, FPSO turret, turret design. So, um, as a offshore engineers or naval architects, you decide which one you, you are going to have a spread mooring system or a turret mooring system. Now, turret mooring actually if you go into this, turret mooring actually the uh, in your spread mooring systems, that means the ship is actually, uh, I mean you do not do any design change, but in case of turret, you have to design the specific bow of the ship or sometimes turrets you will find it is located at midship. Midship lo location of the turret, there is an advantage because you will not be having the pitch, pitching motion. Pitching normally is coming at the forward part or at the aft part. Maximum pitching is going to occur here. Now, if you locate the turret at say LCF position or at midship, you have less pitching motion and uh, there is an advantage, you will get more larger area of the ship. The cross sectional area of the ship will be largest at midship. So, that means you can easily accommodate your turret. Now, if you accommodate this turret and this is actually a moon pool from which all your conductor pipes. So, here your marine risers and conductor pipes will come down from the moon pool you see. So, moon pool, so these are the things which are peculiar to your offshore engineering, moon pool, turret you will come across. Moon pool is a gap in the hull, it looks like, uh, like an inverted funnel. You just make the space hollow and from that you suspend all your the mooring risers. Followed. So, here actually this, uh, yeah, this is called turret mooring in a FPSO. Normally, this turret moorings you will find normally in the FPSO, but uh, in case of semi submersibles and TLPs because uh, there is no enclosed hull, uh, enclosed hull is not there. Uh, enclosed hull is not there, so you need not have a moon pool. So, moon pool will come only for ships having enclosed hull. Now, moon pool design, so moon pool design uh, you just do not design it uh, just to take uh, your, your conductor pipes. Okay, there are other aspects of moon pool design which you will come across that is called uh, water entry. The moon pool is quite a large structure, it will consume as much space as the hold of a ship, a huge structure. So, inside the, uh, inside the moon pool you have large amount of water which will come in 
and it will slosh against the sides of the moon pool and also uh, against the, the uh, marine riser, it will start vibrating. So, moon pool you have water entry and impact, so those, the, that is another area of study in ship dynamics. Moon pool, water entry, the moon pool design, water entry and impact. So, these have to be specifically configured for moon pool design, what is going to be the final shape and the volume of moon pool. So, this is called water entry, this is called entrained water. Entrained water will cause lot of vibratory forces inside the moon pool. <coughs> so, uh, either you have to damp this uh, entrained water or, it's, uh, or you decrease the size of the moon pool. Now, the, these are some of the naval architecture considerations will come across. The other point that is going to uh, about the mooring system which I want to tell you is uh, this is spread mooring system and turret mooring system. Now, in the spread category also, you have uh, spread mooring, you have steel, this is called spread mooring, spread moorings you have SCRs or steel catenary, uh, R of course stands for riser or uh, so, uh, it is called steel catenary mooring systems. Steel catenary moorings, and the other one is called a taut mooring system. Now, here actually in the diagram, I, if you can see this taut mooring systems. Yeah. Now, top mooring system will look like this, that means the mooring chains are, so this is the circle over which you spread your mooring lines. So, you can have the mooring lines like this. So, your vessel is somewhere like this. And the spread mooring system, you will find your mooring lines will be like this. Of course, uh, this, this is a turret mooring, so this, so this is taut and this is your spread mooring line. So, uh, this spread mooring lines actually made of steel, steel chains and taut mooring line if you want to say these are polyester ropes. Now, again you have to decide whether you want to select spread mooring system or a taut mooring system. Now, why the reason is, I told you in spread mooring system, each of these lines actually, you go as far as say 6 or 8 kilometers down to the seabed, because a part of the line, a large part of the line will be lying horizontally on the sea floor. A spread mooring system, you will find that the mooring cable actually lies, the large portion of the line in a horizontal fashion on the sea floor at the other end you have the anchor. So, that actually increases the length of the line. So, in steel actually the line is heavy and lengthy. Line heavy and lengthy, but actually there are uh, uh, one adv big advantage of uh, this spread mooring system if you use steel chains is that the stiffness is more. The mooring system 
all our calculations is uh, actually centered around calculation of mooring stiffness. Mooring system is designed around calculation of mooring stiffness. Now, your mooring stiffness it is similar to your similar to spring stiffness. In vibration, you have come, I have taught you this spring stiffness. So, this is something like this. But of course, this is uh, not a uh, spring, so but it has a springing effect on the ship. So that means uh, the, if, there's, if there's a surge motion on the ship, it goes like this. Then the whole mooring system will try to bring the ship back to its original position. So that is called a spring stiffness. So that means in our mooring analysis, you calculate this. So calculation of mooring system, known as spread mooring system, is advantageous from that point of view. And the other point that you go is. This, uh, this is of course much more lasting than your the polyester ropes. Your polyester ropes you will find in uh, that is in the uh, sea water they will tend to corrode faster. But the advantage of the polyester road, rope is light. It is light and you can see this diagram obviously the length of these polyester ropes are going to be less than your steel catenary. So, this is called a catenary. Uh, first year mechanics, I think you have come across this word catenary chains, how you find out the mechanics of a catenary chain. So, same thing will come here also, you want to design this uh, mooring chains. So, from this diagram, you can easily make out that this ship or a PSO will have less storing problem for the anchor chains than this kind of a catenary mooring system. Where you have to trade off is, it is going to have less stiffness. So, the spring stiffness will be a little bit less than your catenary stiffness. But if you can do away with that, now all these things you have to calculate based on, I told you, moorings are essentially calculated on environmental loads. Moorings that is why before mid semester I talked about C spectra. From that you calculate response spectra. So, all mooring systems are designed around a certain C spectra, which occurs uh, uh, say for the life of the ship or say for a 100 year return period or say 20 year. Normally, you take 100 year return period to be on the safe side. So, what is going to be your uh, the extreme C spectra for that? Based on that, you calculate your moving. The reason is because of motions, you have to restrict motions. And I told you how to calculate this from C spectra, you calculate the response vector via a transfer function. Anyway, so, those are the things which you have to take care of in designing the moorings. Now, coming to the analysis part, the uh, before you uh, go into the analysis, then uh, there are a lot of things uh, which you have to know that is uh, in mooring designs you have uh, what is the damping. First is the calculation of stiffness, then you have what is called hydrodynamic damping. So, the moving stiffness, hydrodynamic damped, damping, then you have vortex induced vibration.
vortex induced vibration normally will occur in moorings as well as in marine risers. Then there will be line damping, what is called line internal damping because of the chains. and damping from seabed. So that means when I was dis discussing about all this, so these are uh, features which you will encounter in either in uh, dynamic analysis or uh, quasi dynamic or sometimes this is called a quasi static analysis. Quasi static dynamic, not in the static case. So, this, this, this damping also uh, after this uh, spring stiffness, you calculate this damping, damping forces. So, here your vibration knowledge will come into play based on what <coughs> spectra motions. Now, uh, coming to the static analysis, so this is uh, uh, we will talk about this is uh, the stiffness part next class. Time is short. Now let us do have a look at this static analysis. Now you consider a reference axis, now you take this axis on the seabed, uh, sorry not on the seabed, on the still water level, say axis you take this is your x and this is your z positive direction of the z axis. Now actually there is a little bit of flaw in the analysis but we will take care of that. So, this is your water plane or mean sea level. Now, say your uh, ship is out here, so that means you give a force on the wind. So, T w. So, here if you look at this diagram, there are the anchored line is supported by, so here this is supported by a windlass. So, this is taken up like this and this is wound on the mooring winch or windlass on the deck of the ship or deck of the platform. So, this is one support point, another support point you are getting where? bed. Now, here the what uh, I am doing this uh, calculation for static analysis that is I am just making a free body diagram of a section of the steel, steel cable and you can calculate all the forces. Now, normally if you want to the, there are uh, complicated analysis that is in your you can make a FEM model for a say chain cable if you want to do this. Uh, in segments. So, that means you nowadays because of your FEM has uh, more rigorous analysis is done, the FEM beam analysis, FEM beam, FEM beam analysis is normally done for this, but this is very complicated you know, you, unless you know FEM you cannot do this or Mm, the calculation of stresses and strains, FEM beam analysis for stress strain calculations.
So, this actually I am not going into uh, details. So, those of you want to take this as a project and all that they can do, but uh, the pro why this is done I am telling you. The, uh, now, in most cases actually there is a trade off between these two systems that is the tot and the spread mooring system. Now, instead the engineers instead of making the catenary chain in uh, with steel, you it is divided into segments. And some of the segments they make of nylon ropes and some segments you can make of uh, the steel cables. Follow. Now, obviously, you are having say two different materials altogether in various segments of the chain cable. Now, if you want to do analysis proper analysis then a simple static analysis which I will, uh, will do in the next class will, will not help. So, that means you have to take care of this FEM beam analysis. So, FEM beam analysis they you know, you have to do for a carved beam element made up of different materials. So, that will obviously give rise to different stresses and strains that are coming onto the uh, chain. So, once you know the stresses and strains, especially the allowable stress at these various segments, then you can decide on your chain cable diameter or your the configuration of your polyester ropes. So, this, this is a comp another area, this is a complicated study. So, you can see first thing if you want to do is you have to formulate your the um, you know, motion coming from the C motions. So, that is one area C load C motions and the other is your structure analysis which is coming from the FEM part. Anyway, so this we will discuss later. Now, uh, coming before we close the normally the static analysis is done like this. So, here that is uh, say your chain cable is coming. So, this is the position of the deck of the ship or you can say this is coming from the uh, here for this is coming from the sea, sea level. So, phi w is the angle that your chain cable is making with the uh, mean sea level and this is taking a catenary shape. Now, what happens is if you have an anchor line, uh, you will find a large portion of the chain cable lying flat on the seabed. Say so, this is your anchor, anchor is coming out here and this is the depth of water. So, this is water depth you can take this is H. Now, this distance that is from the origin to this anchor line. So, anchor line you can uh, normally you can write like draw like this. Now, this distance you write this as X B. Now, there are uh, in our analysis there are two things that you have to calculate. You calculate the length of chain cable. Say you take a, a small portion of the anchor line, you find out the tension. So, tension out here on the water line, so this is given as T w and tension at the horizontal level is given as T 0 at seabed level. So, T w you write tension at winch. Now, one thing you note that the direction of the tensions are different. So, obviously, seabed tension that is uh, actually your tension is supporting the main weight of the chain cable remember that. So, we will find out from that formula and T w is tension at water line. and T 0 is tension at seabed. seabed tension. So, you have to actually calculate this. <coughs> now, remember that this is the starting point if your say uh, your static analysis. Now, so you take a segment or a, you have to draw a, a free body diagram of a part of the chain. So, this is your tension and if the tension at a particular point on the line is making an angle of phi, then the horizontal will be T cos phi, T 
t cos phi and the vertical this will be t sin phi. I said you are having a class. No? So, anyway, we will um, I think on next class on Thursday we will talk about this. So, after this you construct your free body diagram or this part of the chain. So, we will continue with this uh, next class and our goal is to obtain the length of the line.